So in the next part of this video for the um, lecture that I would have given on February 7th, I'm going to talk about adaptation, which is kind of, I mean, it's a bit of an elephant in the room, right, in an evolutionary biology class. I'm sure a lot of you think of adaptation as kind of synonymous with evolution, right? Um, so here we're going to use a fairly specific example of adaptation. So adaptation is a process of genetic change in a population whereby as a result of natural selection the average state of a character becomes improved with reference to a specific function or whereby a population is thought to have become better suited to some feature of its environment. This whole video is just going to be me reading out loud to you as fast as I can. That's the whole thing. JK. Uh, you can also talk about an adaptation which is a feature that has become prevalent in a population because of a selective advantage conveyed by the feature in the improvement of some function. In general, the key takeaway that I want you to have from these definitions is that adaptation is a result of natural selection. So evolution, as you remember, can happen because of mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and or selection. So if evolution, if a change in the allele frequencies in a population over time is driven by genetic drift or gene flow or just mutation, that evolution is not adaptive. So adaptive evolution is a very powerful force in the sort of long-term trajectory of a, of a lot of organisms on Earth. There's, there's a lot of examples of adaptations that we can look at in different types of animals, but not everything that we observe in nature is the result of adaptive evolution. And not everything that we observe uh, morphologically or, or uh, phenotypically in organisms is properly an adaptation. So one kind of important class of things that are uh, kind of interesting to think about and sometimes somewhat overlapping with adaptations, sometimes there are exaptations. Um, there, there's some traits of organisms that one might look at and try to sort of concoct kind of a little a story for. So if, if you're familiar with the idea of um, Rudyard Kipling's just so stories, there's there's a lot of just kind of, yeah, they're, they're just little stories about like how the, how the leopard got its spots or how the pangolin got its scales. Um, as evolutionary biologists, a lot of us are tempted to look at the morphology of an organism and attempt to weave some sort of narrative about why the organism came to look the way it does or behave the way it does or react to chemicals the way it does. But just because we can imagine these narratives doesn't always mean that that's the evolutionary path that these um, structures or phenotypes of the organism have taken. A, a really influential essay in evolutionary biology is this one by uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton called The, Spandro, the Spandrels of San Marco. And this, the general idea of this essay is basically critiquing the adaptationist program, which is sort of, I mean, they kind of caricature it a little bit in this essay, but it's, it's this idea that I was talking about, about trying to attribute every single detail of an organism to the process of adaptive evolution. And in, in many cases, you know, uh, there, there are adaptive explanations for the phenotypes of organisms. But in some cases, um, yeah, morphological structures or phenotypes of organisms might be the result of something that is uh, just either an inevitable structural consequence of the evolution of a different trait in the organism um, or something that's brought along because of the genomic architecture of organisms. So we'll talk about linkage disequilibrium in a little bit in this context. Um, Architecturally, the, the idea of a spandrel that they use in the essay, which subsequent philosophers and biologists and architects have said that these aren't actually technically spandrels, um, these, these spandrels are sort of uh, 
they're just kind of architectural or structural byproducts of the way that arches are constructed. So in order to make a sort of stable structure, you need to have a certain kind of archway. So different kinds of archways, you know, they're, they're obviously just shaped different. But then you're left with these sort of spaces in between the archways that you can then decorate and make really beautiful. But these, these things didn't exist just to, um, you know, contain cool art. They exist first and foremost as just byproducts of the way that they ha the architects had to build arches in these cathedrals. So you might go to a cathedral and say, wow, everything's really beautiful. Everything seems to kind of fit, toge fit together really well. Everything seems to have a purpose. But in some cases, there are sort of these like spaces where the space wasn't like exactly an on purpose space. It was just like, oh, well, you know, in order to have this cool vaulted ceiling, we needed to make arches. And then because arches don't like fit together perfectly, like stacking cubes or something, there are these blank spaces between the arches. So let's like paint something there. That'll be cool. So, so this essay is, is basically just trying to raise the possibility that not every part of an organism is necessarily adaptive. Some traits of organisms might arise as a result of constraints of phylogeny development um, or just sort of general laws of physics. So for example, um, this aminoid shell has a feature in the middle that's just this little kind of depression here, which is called an umbilicus. Some land snails have this, and umbilicus is also the Latin name for your belly button. And an umbilicus is just kind of a, it's just a byproduct of the way in which the aminoid grows, right? That the animal is growing by adding layers of its shell and it's coiling, but the exact size and shape and location of the umbilicus might not really be under strong selection. It's just kind of something that happens as a result of the coiling of the shell. And similarly, your belly button as an adult human, it's not actually adaptive to have a belly button, super duper important for um, the attachment of umbilical cords, you know, during your uh, uh, development as a fetus. And it's, you know, obviously, Placental organisms, placental mammals, have to have an umbilical cord and a connection into the fetus's body uh, from the placenta. But the fact that you have a, a belly button now is not actually adaptive. It's just kind of an architectural byproduct of the way that placental mammals get their nutrition in utero. So, so in general, this this essay is. I don't know, it's, it's a pretty long essay about a fairly minor point in evolutionary biology. But in general, we sort of want you to be aware that not everything about organisms might necessarily be adaptive. Um, genomically, the reason that some genes go to fixation in a population is sometimes not because they themselves are adaptive, but because they're really close to other genes that are adaptive on the chromosome. So if, if this locus is under a strong selection, it'll just kind of drag the really close loci along with it as it goes to fixation. Because even though there's some recombination during meiosis, if genes are super duper close together, they're unlikely to recombine separately. They're more likely to be linked to, to each other in the, as kind of the, the general pattern for that is, link, is called linkage disequilibrium. So in general, if things are really far apart from each other on one chromosome, or if they're on different chromosomes, then they, have, they don't really exhibit linkage disequilibrium. But if they're super duper close, then they might. And so you might have the fixation of alleles in a way that if you only look at the sort of evolutionary trajectory of this one allele in a population over time, 
it might look like natural selection, but it's actually just being driven by uh, sort of a, a sweep by a nearby allele. So uh, these are just some definitions from the book. Um, hitchhiking is the general word for the phenomenon that I just described where an allele that's really close to an allele under selection will also go to fixation in a population. Um, and selective sweep is a really closely related uh, concept. And just as a review, I'm sure you have all talked about meiosis before and like, you know, 18 different biology classes already, but just as a quick review, chromosomes kind of mix up a little bit during meiosis, but it's not a complete, you know, uh, mixing of the chromosomes. It, it tends to just be little chunks of them at a time. And so if we want to kind of put these, some of these ideas together about sort of the limits of adaptation, uh, one way of thinking about it is due to this uh, paleontologist named Zeiliker, who kind of talked about adaptation and, and sort of the possible morphospace that an organism might eventually evolve to as the result of a compromise between different forces. So there's, you could kind of imagine a triangle that has points um, that are, you know, for example, what, what the actual adaptive significance of a trait is. So what the ecology is actually doing to the selective environment of the organism. But you also have to compromise with what the ancestors of that organism look like. And so some of this, um, for some organisms, you know, multicellularity just never evolved, for example, because the right genes weren't around. Um, and this, this kind of historical point of the triangle is also related to the Richard Dawkins video that I posted where they dissect out um, the laryngeal nerve of a giraffe. So, so check out the video on, um, on that that I posted to Blackboard already. And then structural limitations are also going to ultimately determine sort of what's morphologically possible for organisms. So, so organisms can't be bigger than a certain size depending on what sort, of, um, what sort of material their skeleton is made out of, for example. They can't be bigger than a certain size depending on how their circulation or their, um, their respiratory systems work. Uh, so there's, there's different ways of conceptualizing this. So actually, in a later work, Zeiliker and, and a co-author kind of revise this idea and they, they try to make it, the triangle sort of more complicated. They make it into a pyramid um, and they say, oh, okay, well now the vertices are biological function, morphological fabrication, effective environment. And then there's this sort of phylogenetic tradition as the bottom vertex. And then there's like the morphospace is kind of moving upward through time. Bow plan is just a German word that people often use for sort of like body plan of organisms. So like the different animal phyla have different bow plans. Um, you don't have to memorize this for this exam, but just kind of think about adaptations of organisms and sort of the morphospace that are occupied by organisms today as a result of compromises between different potential pressures, including what the environment is sort of dictating what the history of the organism permits and what sort of laws of physics and chemistry permit. So a lot of this, you know, Xyliker triangle stuff and spandrels of San Marco was traditionally framed around uh, animal evolution, but bacteria also have um, evolutionary limitations and there's also genomic architectural considerations to what's sort of evolutionarily possible in bacteria. Uh, what I'll talk about in the next video is uh, a tiny bit about antibiotic resistance, and then I'm going to move on to some cool phage therapy stuff. So check that out in a little bit. Okay, bye.